Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to talk. I know that I'm between you and the drinks out there, um, so thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to talk about the evolution of uh, the Ray platform and how we accommodate for the Gen AI era. As you see, we got the Gen AI in the title, so it's my man. Um, Netflix. Uh, why do we personalize Netflix? We have um, <clears throat> we help members uh, find entertain entertainment to watch and enjoy, and we're in the business of maximizing our members' uh, joy. Uh, what do we personalize? Almost everything that we have in the site is personalized for you uh, to the construction of the page, which is uh, employing different rows from candidate of rows to the title that comes in the row to the order that comes in, in every row. The titles that go in every row also um, sorted in a way that it's uh, suitable for you. The, uh, the most uh, uh, high rank uh, titles go first and later on the, the less so. Um, we also personalize the image that comes to your site. So different users might see different uh, artwork uh, depending to what suits to, to their uh, appeals to them. <clears throat> what is the model production workflow? Like uh, um, we have an end-to-end -end machine learning research uh, that uh, produces models uh, to refine the product on Netflix. And this is the life cycle of um, a model. You, have, you come to, with an idea, you model that, uh, you produce the code that uh, will run an experiment, you do offline experimentation, you compare the metrics with the, the ones that we have of, offline, and if your idea is successful, you promote it into an A-B test. And in, in the A-B test, we decide if your model is better than the one that we have in production. So for many, many researchers have many experiments, and every experiment has lots of cells in an A-B test. Uh, so one of these uh, uh, squares is a training. So if we have 11 cells, we have 11 models trained with different variations each. Uh, so you can see the explosions of, of models that, uh, that we have to train every day. And these are uh, personalized models that need to train daily in a 24-hour cycle. The Netflix training platform, how we, we, we accommodate rate for, for doing this uh, massive amount of training. We have uh, recommendation models that are um, the LRM architecture, and they are heavy on embedding tables and, and, and categorical features and MLP. Um, so these are, these are very short uh, models in computation time, but very large data sets. So we need to uh, fine tune the, the IO in order to accommodate for, the, for training uh, th this, this type of models. Um, we have uh, a bottleneck in the grading communication, um, and we do multi-GPU distributed for, the, for those models. We have, uh, for, uh, for MediaML, uh, multi-model models that learn uh, representations. We have diverse set of uh, data sources, text. We have lots of text, uh, image, audio, videos, uh, you name it. And we have a um, very large data set that derive from the original assets. Um, we also have a multi-GPU, multi-node training for very massive models in distributed data parallel fashion. Um, we also employ uh, a sizable number of uh, uh, language models. Um, we, we don't produce our own uh, models, but we fine tune models that are out there, uh, Llama being one. Um, and we have uh, accommodated for different sizes of model uh, to, to train in multi-GPUs, and we use uh, fully shared data parallel for fine tuning those. Um, the competitions are more intensive because these are tr transformer based. Uh, uh, but this is the characterization of what we have. Um, we have given a talk last year about the, the details of how we build this training platform, how we consider the I.O. to be more important, and how we have a heterogeneous uh, selection of uh, resources. Uh, I invite you to go there and, and see more if you want to know the details. I will recap on, on a few things. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the, the, the heterogeneous uh, nature of the cluster. So you have a head node, and then we organize the machines uh, in pools of the similar types. So if you have a, a pool of machines, of P4 machines in AWS, we have 800 uh, uh, GPUs, and another pool with 810 GPUs, and we accommodate the pools according to the different type of GPUs that you have. And also we have a, a, a pool for CPU machines. So whenever you, you come with a workload that uh, uh, spans different type of GPUs or GPUs plus CPU, you can accommodate in these uh, three pools or more, depending on your cluster. 
We also have a dedicated file system, FSX, for high throughput, and um, another share file system for, for low-level uh, things, like uh, checkpoints or uh, metrics or metadata that we need to collect from all the clusters. Um, we employ many of these clusters. We employ clusters in a durable fashion. We deploy one cluster, and we, the cluster stays up until we train all the models that we want, uh, and then we deploy every, every so often. Uh, so, sometimes the models, the, the clusters stay up for a month or more. We have also the idea of sharing resources by team. So uh, there, are, uh, there is a model that you can say, I have a cluster per job. Uh, the model that we employ, which is a cluster per team, so uh, chances are that the people in your team are training the same type of model, so the, 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 the cluster doesn't have to accommodate for different workloads. They are all similar. So, so naturally, they, 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 you can ask isolate teams by having different uh, consumption of clusters. And there is another notion that if you have an Uber cluster with everything, you can toss everything there, but then it's, it's a little bit more difficult to, to manage. The inconvenience of having uh, clusters per team is that one team cannot employ idle resources in other team. So then if, uh, if, if a workloads in one team finish and you have idle machines, you cannot employ them in your workload. So it's a, um, so in a process where, where these machines are very scarce and we only uh, have so few of them, uh, we need to maximize the use of them. Uh, uh, one problem is that, uh, I say, we cannot share resources between clusters. Um, another one is that, uh, operationally, we need to stop all the jobs that go to a cluster in order to redeploy or upgrade the cluster. Um, and we also have, uh, having multiple clusters, one per team, it's difficult for us to collect visibility, UIs, and metrics from all the clusters in a central location. So the solution was to create a job scheduler, uh, a colleague that is here in the audience, Kedar, uh, is in charge of uh, um, the job scheduler. And the job scheduler has a routing system between route uh, clusters. So you now submit to the job scheduler and you don't care when it's going to be executed or where it's going to be executed. The job scheduler will take care of it. As long as it respects the SLA, you're fine. Uh, the, syst uh, the, the system uses uh, queues, so we can, we, can, we can have different queues for different teams and then uh, the teams allocate how many resources per queue uh, you need. And it has pluggable policies, so we can fine tune how we're gonna uh, get the jobs executed in a, in, a, in a given time to maximize the, the resources, which is the, the, the important part for the scheduler. In a picture, you can see it like this. Uh, you have a central place where you submit the, the, the job, and in that job lands into a queue. And, and, and you have a job monitor that is constantly monitoring uh, uh, in round robin fashion all the jobs that are running in the cluster. And with the faculty of pausing and resuming jobs if, if the scheduler sees so. So if you are running a low, low priority job and a high priority job can, needs to come in, you can signal that job to checkpoint stop and free the resources for the high priority job to come in. Um, this is the, the, the key advantage of having the scheduler being the central brain of all the, the clusters. And we have also the resources being monitored constantly, so the scheduler is a central place where you can monitor the usage of all the clusters that, that we have. Um, also, it's a simplicity for the users, because you now send it to one place. You don't need to remember which cluster is assigned to you and how to use the shared clusters that, uh, that we have for ad hoc computations. So re to reiterate, it's a um, fair resource allocation. So we also make a distinction between the ad hoc experimentation, one-off things that are, you want to run, versus the production jobs that need SLA. Uh, we have pluggable policies. Uh, we, we can design any policy we want and then just plug it in, to, into, uh, uh, in code, in the, in, the, in the scheduler, and we obey the, how we can, uh, uh, we, we, we want to be the queues and the jobs in that queue to behave. Um, we also have dynamic uh, uh, resource configuration. So if, you, if your job normally trains in an 800, uh, but an 800 is not available, you can downgrade to an 810 uh, 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 if your job supports it. Uh, so you can, you can run in one type of GPU or another, uh, uh, depending on, on, on the availability. And we also have preemption. So let's say you have a long running job that it's running seven days and a bunch of crunch comes from jobs that need to use the cluster. You can suspend the, and the, the, the long running job 
evict it from the cluster and move all the other jobs to run on the resources. And when they finish, you can resume back with the long run job. Um, we also have simplified operations because uh, having many clusters, we can direct all the traffic from one cluster to other clusters while we deploy it. And once the cluster is up and ready, we can go back with the traffic. The, the same way you have a load balancer in HTTP conversations, you can have that uh, with clusters and jobs. And it had a, a, an abstraction of clusters. We can have different clusters, different size, and different uh, type of operations, but the scheduler abstract that away as a single cluster. We can have this idea that everything is a single machine, you know, single cluster, instead of many. And we have a centralized UI, a centralized observability metrics, and so on. Um, Another addition to the training platform uh, uh, was uh, the creation of this HBO manager. I know, we know that the array comes with Tune, but this is a simplified version of that, and it's very opinionated on using Optuna, which is the, the engine that we choose uh, as a default. And it works in conjunction with the scheduler. The scheduler can uh, give a special queue with the available resource for your ex HBO experiment. Remember, an HBO is no other than a for loop with many training jobs at once. So uh, uh, the HBO manager babysits in turn uh, all the trainings that you need to do. And then it controls the state of the experiment because the experiment, which is many training jobs at once, can be also checkpointed and paused and evicted from the cluster. And then once you have the opportunity to run it again, you can resume where, where you left off with many, many trials. Um, and this is also from a colleague of mine, uh, Vinko, which might not be here today. but. Um, we have the user experience. Uh, it's, if you're familiar with Optuna, this is Optuna uh, in the cloud for many uh, jobs. Uh, it has a minimal change on the training API, so if you have your job already using a training, the training API, we just inject uh, the parameters that you want to explore, and then that immediately routes you to use the HPO manager instead of the training. Uh, use visualization, uh, central dashboard where you collect all the visualizations so people can go and see their experiment while the experiment is running. You can go and see the, the stream of data coming to, to a dashboard. Um, and it has the operational things that, uh, you know, the, the scheduler takes care of the HPO and the HPO pauses and resumes automatically. Let's go to the GNI use cases. Um, so, uh, there are some things that we cannot talk too much about because we still don't know, uh, which is uh, one is uh, the generative recommenders. So I left that out uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity. But uh, we are exploring uh, foundational models and uh, generative recommendation systems, which are uh, very heavy. Uh, uh, we're we're going to talk about uh, uh, LLMs. Uh, uh, we do fine tuning for LLMs, and why why would we prefer that instead of using OpenAI or or, or, the, or any other uh, uh, good LLMs out there? It's because of the customizability. We can just uh, fine tune in, um, with more uh, freedom, and we also have sensitive cases. We cannot send the data over the wire to some third party, so it's better if we can maintain it within the company. Um, we have also a, a different tasks that depend on, on fine-tuned models, so we can build on top of uh, fine-tuned models. The, 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 the LLMs that we fine-tune serve as a backbone for other tasks. And, and we, by having access to the LLMs ourselves, it's like we, we, we can do specialized um, um, a serving solutions, so we can do for throughput or, or for latency, depending on the case. Uh, Ray makes it very easy for us to scale the, the, the fine tuning and the, and the evaluation, so we use it uh, thoroughly. And uh, for models that are very large that you need to partition and do uh, in multiple GPUs or sometimes in multiple nodes, uh, uh, Ray plus VLLM um, was a very nice alternative that simplifies all the mess there, so we can we employ it. This is also uh, a contribution of one of our team members, Dan, which is also in the audience, if you want to talk to him after. Um, in pictures, it looks like this. We have a, a, a pipeline that uh, uh, fine tunes, and after fine tuning, evaluates, and after evaluation, publishes. Uh, the evaluation, depending on the model, might be very large, and you need to partition the model, so that's why we employ a VLLM in the evaluation. 
And uh, once you deposit the model in, in the model repository, you can then pick it up with a serving system if you, if you need a scale, or you can pick it up as a single researcher just to evaluate if the model is, is right and then uh, employ it in your tasks. Um, the most active uh, project I've been working lately is in multimodal uh, data sets. Building multimodal data sets with all the data that we have at Netflix is uh, uh, it's a, a non-trivial task. And we're going to describe a little bit how we are employing the array in order to build this. What is a multimodal data set? Multimodal data set, uh, we employ uh, some data that uh, can be in the form of pictures or video or audio or text. And we augment the data with the aid of models. So if you have uh, millions of images, you cannot scan them by hand and see if the, mod if the images are good or bad. So in order to assess quality, you need to employ a model that looks into the pictures and give you a score. So then you can then filter the ones that are bad or the good. The same way you cannot caption, caption meaning annotate the images if you send it out to, to, to a third party service, it will take six months to annotate all the images and it costs a lot of money. So we also employ a model, and in this case, it's picture as Lava 1.6. And you take a picture with the aid of a prompt, and you can add, uh, say, describe this image with this data without uh, naming pictures or without describing the background. Or you need to craft the prompt in order to to, to get the, the correct output. Some other models are more complex. In the case of Florence here, uh, picture in green, uh, you employ uh, an image together with a caption. And with the two, you generate bounding boxes of the objects present in the caption. So there is a man, there is a woman, there is a, uh, a cat, there is a car. And there is another uh, column that we use in order to explore the uh, uh, data sets that is uh, uh, for embeddings. So you produce embeddings for either the images or, or the audios or the videos. And you can use that uh, embedding column to do nearest neighbor search or to cluster and to figure out the composition or the distribution of your, of your huge data set. So what is needed in order to create this uh, data set? You need a model management, so you need a way to easily and cheaply move away and um, 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 share models that uh, people employ. Uh, we can take models from open source, we can fine tune them and use th those models to, to create columns. We need a batch inference system in order to produce this at a very large scale. And we also need a way to store this data because it's, uh, the data is huge and then you need, uh, um, and you need a lot of GPUs. Uh, uh, models. So, we have why we need models in in, a, in building data sets. So, so now the data sets are very heavy in inference, and you need to probably process them with models to obtain uh, results. In this case, the first model is a non-safe for work. Uh, so, it, this is a vision transformer that you need to feed in the image, and the model will turn a high score if there is nudity in, in the image, a low score if otherwise. So then you can, um, you can filter the images this way. So you need to do a big pass on the images first and filter the ones that you're not going to use by different scores. Um, the same way, uh, when you caption, you use a, a pre-trained uh, language model, uh, which also comes with a vision encoder. In this case, it's Lava. We use many, many captioners. And for every caption, you need to fine tune the way you prompt it uh, to get the output that you, uh, that you want without too many hallucinations. Audio has the same treatment. You can uh, use uh, employ a variety of models in order to separate audio, to transcribe audio, to do things with audio. Um, we use uh, clip score uh, to compare the similarities between the image and the text. The, you get a high score if the, if the text and the image are similar. You get a low score if they have nothing to do with each other. And with that, we can evaluate if the, if the text uh, that we caption with the previous model is good or not. And we can let go of the bad captions or retry with a different caption. There is also the use of uh, embedding models. Uh, for images, we use clip. Uh, for, for text, we use sentence transformer. And they generate different vectors on different sizes. Uh, there, is, there are universal models that you can embed anything into the same space. Uh, so. Um, you can use it to compare if the, the, their things are related or, or if the, the, the data that you construct in a row is, has a mismatch. New types of models are coming. Uh, we are using these two as an instance of autoregressive models. That means one token at a time, they can describe uh, boxes, labels, 
in the text out of an image. Uh, so in one go, they can do multitask, and they also do this in an autoregressive manner, which is impressive. Um, two instances of those are Microsoft Florence and Google Pali, Pali Gemma. Um, I don't know if I pronounced it right. Um, how does it look like in practice? So we have uh, uh, millions of images that come in a data set, and we filter out the non-safe for work, and we keep the rest. Um, another thing that we do is we have uh, uh, models that uh, assess the aesthetics of the image. And you can, you can say that the model will give you a high score if the, if the, if the image has high aesthetics uh, and low score otherwise. And we keep the super high quality, the top 10% uh, of the, the images to have a high quality pass on data sets. We keep the remaining ones as a bulk of the data set, and we eliminate the bottom for images that are not good for the task at hand. So images that are completely black, or uh, images that have blurry faces, or things that uh, are not good for the task at hand. This is also a, a huge step in automation because you don't have time or money to do this with, uh, with uh, humans of the, the large uh, size of the data sets. Captioning, this is an example of captioning. Uh, we employ different captioners. Some captioners are short, so a man and a woman hugging in the crowd. It's a very simple caption. Uh, other, other captioners are much more detailed, and they, they, they exhibit a lot of uh, uh, expressiveness when they describe all the things that happen in the scene. We also have face recognition and, and face detection and face recognition, so we can say that that woman is Jennifer Lopez. So we can do another pass with another LLM saying, like, when you describe a man and a woman, and if we give you a hint of who's the woman, can you give me a new description? And the LLM will rewrite the description, put in the characters or the actors in, in, in the scene. Um, we have different sort of metadata that comes with the title, so the genre or, you know, I don't know, uh, the season, we, the time it was uh, recorded, uh, who's in the uh, photography, uh, who's in the director. So all of that uh, enriches the, the assets that, that, that we have. Um, hallucinations are very common. If we start employing this at scale, mo mo many of the models that we used, uh, for example, in the first picture, it says the, the title of this image is The Dark Knight Rises, which is not, this is another movie completely different. Uh, and, and the second one says perhaps the reflection, she's reflecting on the words of the Korean drama, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if that Korean drama, but it's not this. Uh, so. And you need to have another model that inspects this, because we cannot inspect this as human. This is a lot of data. So you need to have a model that inspects this, uh, the opus of all the model and assess the quality, if it's good or bad. Um, comparing LLM, BLMs, uh, visual language models. Uh, so we have here in, in one column, we see COG VLM, uh, Lava, and Florence. And they have different levels of uh, uh, a granularity on the description, so we, we need to employ another model to, 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 to say, is there a, ma a man in the picture? Because the, 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 the sentence says there's a man. Is there a woman in the picture? Yes, no. Uh, is there a, um, I don't know, dark background? Yes or no? And then you start getting yes or no's for all the questions that you ask to, to the LLM, and then you can do um, precision recall and then see if the, the, which one of the captioners is better for you. Uh, in the first one, that it's a black and white, uh, I highlighted a, there is a, uh, a sign saying, in case of fire. And believe me, if I zoom in, there is a, a tiny word on top of the telephone that says, in case of fire. So the LMs are very good at also doing OCR. So you, you capture the text coming from the, from the picture. Um, so batch inference. Uh, how do we do this? So uh, normally people say, oh, if I have a model, I put it in a server, and then I do a request response, and I can get back uh, the inference produced by that model. This is normally the case when you, when you have maybe a Java service, and the, the, the inference run in a GPU in a different machine, um, uh, or if you don't have access to the model. But if you, if you need to have a cascading of models, like model one, two, and three, now the client engages in this conversation with a lot of yellow payloads that come and go that are temporary payloads. Because you send it to one model, the output of one model needs to be fed to the second model, and then the client becomes very bloated in being a coordinator of all of this. And also remember that every box that says model one and model two is many boxes with many model, many instances of the same model. So the clients become very bloated in, in, in trying to coordinate all of this. Um, 
but it's a solution if you don't have the, the same platform of your model is closed source. Another way of doing this is with bulk inference. Um, uh, bulk inference uh, coming from uh, um, the idea that you can do the inference in the same, you can have the threads that do the IO operations in the same machine that does the inference. So you, in one, in one thread you are reading the data, then you are doing the inference and you're writing the data in the same machine. Um, uh, this uh, is done with the bulk asynchronous parallel uh, framework, so you kind of have the idea if you have many of those, they are doing that in parallel, in every stage you dump the data uh, at the end in, in the disk. If you have a cascading of models, you have a lot of yellow uh, temporary data, and so you need to process the entire data with the first model, dump the data, then read the data again, process it with the second model, and so on. Um, how about ray data? If we use ray data, ray data uh, introduces the, the, the notion of shared memory. And the, the, the beauty of this is that you now have a thread that reads batches at a time and they put that, uh, that batches in memory. Now, the only thing that you exchange uh, with models is the pointers to the data. So you have a pointer that picks a batch and then when you finish, you deposit the batch in, in the memory and another model picks up with the pointer and you only exchange pointers between models. Um, and, and, and this is more suitable for having you know, a streaming batch inference. Um, this, from the documentation, this picture says it all. Uh, we can uh, uh, deploy every stage of a, of a pipeline in CPUs or in GPUs, and you, you notice that uh, the, uh, the actor pools that hold the two models, the classification model and the segmentation model, have n different number of instances. So the classification model might be in cheap, uh, in, in computation, might employ only three instances, while the segmentation model being more heavy, employ five. So now you see that th these pools are elastic, and you can, as, uh, uh, to, to trying to maintain the constant uh, flow of, of, of batches from one end to, uh, to another, uh, Ray accommodates for the scale of these uh, two pools, so you have a constant stream. All of this is automated, it's done for you, and, uh, and you, don't, you don't need to do anything other than write the the entire transformation uh, sequence. Um, it's as easy as wrapping the model and, and, and doing a process with a batch in and batch out. So you read the data, you do the inference, and you write the data. Um, if you use an LLM, you instantiate an LLM, and then you, you get, a, this is an example of a summarizer. And the beauty of this is that also this you can test. You, here you can run the summarizer in a batch, in a, in a test code without using the RAI, the RAI subsystem. We just uh, evaluate all the transformations independently and then you, you can toss it into the uh, RAI batch system. What do you need to worry about? You don't need to worry about doing all of this because it's done for free for you, but you need to worry about how to feed the model in the GPU. Now you're concentrated on how to uh, optimize and employ the model into the memory of the GPU. Um, also, remembering that the extra RAM that you get free in the, in the, in the GPU card is for accommodating the number of uh, um, uh, elements that you can process at a given time. So if you employ a small card, the extra memory that you have might be not enough for holding more than one element, so you process one element at a time. If you have a card with more RAM, you can process more in a batch. That means you, you get more throughput out of the, the same. So you, can, you need to play between the quantization and trying to fit the model in the right place, speed to get the throughput, and also memory free so you can get batches uh, continue, continuously. Um, and the last thing that you might need to worry about is uh, how you start processing this data because you, you have some data and you created one column at a time and you have your data set. Now more data comes in a new show, a new TV show, a new set of audio, something you need to process. If you, if you can keep the deltas, it would be awesome because you can uh, play with the deltas and aggregate. And, and But sometimes you need to also aggregate that and save the resulting data set. So the resulting data set keeps growing when you keep copies of the previous data sets. And this, in terabytes, it sounds uh, ridiculous, but it, when, once you start reaching 100 and petabytes, this becomes a very uh, problematic. The same way you think about this in columns. So if you have a data set of 10 terabytes and you add another column, that's one terabyte. And then you add another column, another terabyte. And you, if you keep the deltas, if you can keep the deltas, it would be awesome because you can just grow the data set of what you need. Otherwise, you need to keep having copies of your data lying around over and over. Uh, so here's the segue to a data set format. We are testing the waters, playing with LANs format, which uh, um, 
has a couple of uh, niceties compared to, to dealing with parquet files. And the two ones that I want to mention very briefly is the vector search. It comes included. You have an index on columns, so you can employ it directly with the format. And you also have zero, uh, zero copy uh, versioning. So you can, you can keep the deltas, which is the thing that I, I mentioned before. Um, if you think about this pictorically and you want to remember, um, you have V1, and if you add rows, the rows are appended atomically, and there is a manifest that have pointers to the two uh, file one and version one and version two, and that becomes the whole data set. If you decide to add a column, that is also appended up atomically, and the manifest file cont contains pointers to, the, to, to all of these objects. And you keep adding, then you can far, uh, roll back and roll forward on the same data set uh, without confusing anyone. And the last one is you know, vector search. It comes for free. The, the two algorithms that are, are being used for disk-based uh, 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 approximated na nearest neighbors search, um, which is very convenient when you need to explore this data set, when you need to plot this data set, and you need to understand what is it that I put inside, because that will determine the quality of your model. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. No questions. I need to repeat the questions when you ask them. No question there. I made a joke in a past presentation, and I mentioned you. I quote you correctly. Oh, yes. Nice you. <laughs> uh, I was curious about Lance. Like, what led you to explore it, and what were you thinking about about like deciding whether it would move to like production or whatever? Like, I'm curious what the criteria. Yeah, is. this is an exploration. We're not. I'm not uh, saying that we should or you should. But uh, but uh, I have a. Uh, I have a lot of cuts also, uh, razor blade cuts. Uh, but the promise there is that uh, uh, you, the format allows for arrow, so everything is based on arrow. So if you if you if you're happy with all the ecosystem uh, that uh, employs arrow, arrow, uh, there's a talk also about lands uh, tomorrow. You, uh, you should attend and, and see. Um, the columns can be very wide. It doesn't matter. They, it, it eliminates the row groups uh, that are present in parquet that impedes it's an impediment for us to store very large blobs in, uh, and, and the problem is that in Parquet you read a, a, a very large, uh, you want to do point queries and read one element, and if the element is too big, you fetch the entire row group and you exhaust the memory of the readers and you need to try it again. And there is no good row group that you can do, it's always biting you. It's very good for, for, for tabular data, but it's kind of inconvenient for blobs. And blobs here also can be tensors. We store tensors of uh, 1,000 for uh, 400,000, uh, 120 for 4,000, and those are blobs, uh, and we store them. In. And the other the convenience is that cheaply you have a, 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 an index in place. You don't need to ingest the data into another system in order to query it. You just have it, and then you pass it around. You have one pointer to the data set, S3 location slash 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 my data set, and I give it to you, you modify it, and, and I can query the same, and it's the same. It's like an iceberg in, in, a, in a sense. You have one table. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, versioning is uh, it's also very good to have. Uh, Check it out. Thank okay. you. So, so, so the question is that if ray data uh, uh, graph can scale uh, 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 and works the same if you have limited number of yeah. GPUs. Uh, you, you need, so if you have a stage that has six uh, stages, you need at least six GPUs. If you have less, you cannot run it because you, you, you employ one GPU, another GPU, another GPU, and the last stage is waiting for resources and it will never execute. That's the limit. Yeah, like imagine the best, like for Fubu, is first, uh, imagine I have 20 GPUs, minimum I need is six. And the most optimal is first I move like 10 to the first one, I have two for the others, then I move 10 to the second one. And the data flows basically. Yeah, so, so if you see here, uh, one of the uh, parameters is concurrency. And I have two to 10. That means that stage, needs a minimum of two GPUs and a maximum of 10. 
So if you, if you leave the maximum to the maximum number of GPUs you have in your cluster, every stage will automatically uh, adapt uh, as, as the flow comes in. So the optimal will be discovered by the system, not by you. You can do it by hand, forcing to have every stage consume this stage two, this stage four, but, uh, but if you let the system do it, it, it's, its thing, it will automatically balance between the two and, and scale it up. And as you are finishing one stage, this uh, pool can extinguish, and that pool can uh, assimilate the other and finish. So, uh, so with something like this, we ran into problem there because the array has that cache, and cache is tied to the node that puts in the cache. As it is scaled down, the data that this next stage wanted to pull from the plasma cache was missing because the owner node was gone. But, the, but this is, uh, uh, so the, the problem is that uh, I need to repeat the question. Uh, um, if you have two machines, that machine has the data in the memory store, and the other machine can pull it from the yeah, from the. But automatically, Ray will pull the data from that node and copy to the next node in a arrow copy, zero copy fashion, and then you can have it in the second node. I don't understand what you're saying. We can take it offline if you want the details, but uh, yeah. I don't see people, so just say say what you want. The question is uh, if we have made a semantic analysis on videos. Yeah, but like taking it to the next level, do you use it for like creating Yeah, so, so there, there, are, there are many teams in Netflix that uh, build models uh, based on media. Uh, and, and yeah, I can, I can mention a couple of uh, problems that we sort out uh, with, uh, with Genitive. But we, 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 we need to employ models in order to understand the content that we because it is kind of out of hands. It's too much content for, for let the machines do the work. Is uh, the NSFW detection for embedding content on the platform? And are you using Florence 2 for that? Mm, uh, no, uh, so is uh, non-safe for work uh, uh, an option for us vetting to the platform uh, to exhibit other users? No, this is only internal. This is so we, the researchers, work in the cycle without looking at uh, inconvenient photos while you're working with your, and then we don't want the models to produce inconvenient and photos. Are you using Florence too as the state of the art for that? No, we are using a model that we fine tune uh, that is uh, based on a uh, vision transformer. Um, it's a classifier. It gives you yes nudity, no nudity, and then we, yeah, it's not sophisticated in the sense that uh, it will give you more details. We can take the rest of the questions offline and then they need to cut the transmission. Thank you for coming.